All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am an academic, uh, so I'm here to present a, what I hope will be a provocative academic question. Um, I do not have a, I don't, I don't run any programs in, in public dip diplomacy, but I basically study um, human interaction at all levels, domestic and international levels. And because of that, my, my, my interest is on international migration. So um, in a few minutes, you, you will see my PowerPoint uh, presentation once I set it up and you'll be able to follow. Um, you know, the presentation, but uh, let me say that uh, the, pre the, the ideas that I'm going to share with you today are part of my, my next publication. This is a, a, a chapter that I've been asked to write for, for a forthcoming book on, on the American dream uh, and, and uh, Hispanics in the United States. So um, one of the, excuse me, Wonderful. All right. So, and again, uh, if you want to get in touch with me at some point, um, you know, I, I, I'm a Catholic university. Um, you go to the Department of Sociology, you look at faculty, my email and my contact information is there if you want to, fa if you want to follow up with me. About uh, 70 years ago, uh, the State Department uh, created an office uh, that was called the, the Office of um, International Information and Cultural Affairs. And that office uh, was in charge of framing cultural diplomacy uh, after World War II. Um, and and the, oh, during, I should say, during World War II uh, and during the post-war uh, era. The idea of cultural diplomacy had a security component, which I'm going to discuss in a few minutes. However, I'm going to ask, I'm going to argue uh, here today that there was an unintended consequence to the promotion of cultural diplomacy and to the, to the, uh, to the success of cultural diplomacy. And that, that unintended consequence was that uh, the United States was presented around the world as a land of opportunity and therefore it incited a migration into the United States from uh, different parts of the world. So my argument is to, uh, to argue that uh, when we look at international migration and specifically we ask the question why so many people desire to come to the United States and live here, uh, one of the uh, consequences or one of the reasons that we need to examine is the success of cultural diplomacy in framing, in portraying uh, the country as a land of opportunity uh, where there is equality and opportunity for, for all groups. Okay. So uh, the thesis of my presentation is that um, uh, liberal ideas em embedded in the American dream, in the notion of the American dream, uh, not only promoted uh, migration, but also help uh, with the assimilation of immigrants. Um, as I said a moment ago, uh, the, this is an unintended consequence because the American dream was never a, a formulated to promote migration. Uh, the American dream was formulated as part of a, an a strategy, a security strategy that, that is called peripheral containment. And it was the idea of trying to contain uh, Soviet expansionism and communist expansionism in developing societies. And like with any strategy, uh, there was a need for an ideology to go along uh, to justify it and to basically make sense of that strategy. Uh, and the American dream uh, was a convenient uh, ideology to do so. And, and you will see why in a few minutes. Before uh, I, I tell you why, let me tell you um, one, of the, um, one of the cases that inspired me to think along these lines. And this is a, a Pulitzer Prize uh, journalist by the name of Jose Antonio Vargas, who is from the Philippines. And in, he published an editorial in the New York Times in, in, 2000, in 2011 in which he describes how his family 
uh, particularly his mom, uh, put him on a plane by himself uh, and sent him to California to, to live with his grandparents, maternal grandparents. And the, the reason behind uh, sending him over was so that he would have a better future. And I think that when you analyze this particular story, it becomes a very, very telling for migration. Uh, first of all, um, one of the things that we need to take into account is that uh, the family took the risk and the cost and assumed uh, you know, a tremendous amount of responsibility in sending this child by himself across the Pacific uh, you know, to live with grandparents, with, to live with relatives away from, you know, the immediate family. Uh, I think this is actually very, very telling because it tells uh, to the extent that immigrants are willing to risk uh, family ties, a uh, harmony in the family, uh, the well-being perhaps even of, ch of children to be able to achieve this dream, this dream uh, that we call here in the United States uh, the American dream, and I will explain in a few minutes. Uh, the second uh, uh, telling story is that, uh, of this anecdote is that uh, Vargas uh, learned of the American dream, or his mom learned of the American dream back in the Philippines. And this is actually very fascinating uh, today when we deal with transnational issues and the diffusion of ideas because the American dream was also never intended originally to, to be exported abroad. It was an, an, an idea that was conceptualized to deal with the Great Depression here in the United States, as you will see in a few minutes. So now uh, we have to ask a question, how come is it that immigrants know about the American dream even before they land on the United States? And, and my reasoning for that, my explanation, my propose, what I'd like to propose to you is that they learn about this dream before they land in the United States because of uh, the cultural diplomacy and how the American dream is portrayed and is dif disseminated in cultural diplomacy programs. Um, today, uh, if you've been around Washington for more than a week and you've been reading the newspapers, you know that uh, there is a large influx of uh, children from Central America that are coming to the United States, and they are attempting to cross the border in the Southwest. And right now, uh, they are in detention centers. Um, there is some, um, some confusion. Some people say that some of them will be given asylum. Others will be released to the parents even without asylum. Uh, but the majority of them, uh, the, at least publicly, the idea is that they will be returned home. Uh, whatever the fate of these children uh, it do, is, is irrelevant. Uh, what's more, more relevant is that here again we see a replication of the Vargas stories. You know, we see families sending kids alone across three or four countries in a very dangerous uh, journey to come to the United States to pursue this dream. Um, the Washington Post report that the uh, Immigration and Nationalization Services and the Border Patrol has estimated that 90,000, again, let me repeat this figure because it's very telling, 90,000 uh, children uh, would be uh, uh, captured um, attempting to cross the border today from Mexico to uh, the United States. Not all of them are from Mexico. In fact, the majority of them come from Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala. And the reason for that is that, as you probably know, these countries are one of the most dangerous in the world. Uh, and I, I say these conscientious of the audience, of the diverse audience that is here. And they are one, when, you, when you look at murders per capita, uh, they have one of the highest murder per capita uh, rate in the, in, the, in the world. For example, in Honduras, just to give you an example, the murder rate per capita is 24, 24 uh, murders uh, per day. 24 murders per day 
up, uh, per capita. In the United States, it's only three. The United States is a huge country. So Honduras is uh, smaller than many of our states in the United States. It tells you the level of violence that exists in this society. There was a truce between the, the, uh, you know, the, the drug traffickers and the government, and among the drug traffickers, mediated by the church. But all indications that we have is that that truce basically um, failed. And now violence has escalated again, thus prompting the, the children uh, or the families to send the children by themselves across uh, you know, these very dangerous societies and across Mexico to come into the United States. So uh, all of this is, is a testament that uh, when people are willing to take such risk and such cost, and they're willing to send children without knowing what their fate will be, is a testament of the power of ideas and the power of perception. And in many ways, uh, the success of the American dream as a part of our cultural diplomacy. Um, uh, this who says, uh, again, uh, uh, let me repeat, my argument is that this was completely unintended. I'm not saying that we promoted the American dream to, to, to promote migration. That was not the case. Uh, it was a, an unintended consequence, but an intended consequence that is very, very important and, and, um, and, and you know, uh, significant uh, for, for today's event in, in world affairs. Okay. So uh, let me talk briefly about what the American dream is and how this idea came about, because this is very important uh, part of my story. The American dream, um, when you look at the American dream and the values of the American dream, individualism, opportunities, equality under the law, uh, freedom to invest, uh, the significance of private ownership, all of these values, uh, have been part of the American culture for many, many years. In fact, they are part of what we call the American creed. However, uh, the term the American dream was formulated by a historian from Columbia University in 1931 in a book called The Epic of America. Why uh, he formulated this idea in 1931? If you look at social history in the United States, you know that the United States has had three significant waves of migration. And the second significant wave of migration started around 1912 and concluded around 1926, 27. Um, when these migrants came to the United States, primarily from Mediterranean uh, Europe, uh, they were here to work and to provide for a better family for themselves and their families. However, a uh, few years after they arrived, in fact, a, a year or so after they arrived, the United States economy crumbled and the great migration took place. Unemployment skyrocketed, opportunities uh, you know, were not available, and there was a great deal of nationalism, anti-immigrant feelings uh, in the United States as well as el elsewhere. Uh, the book, the, uh, the, the Epic of America, uh, formulates the American dream to, to give hopes to these immigrants, to basically tell them that they may be, going now, may, may be going through a very tough time now, but in the future, things were gonna be better. And in the future, a much, much, much better opportunities would await for them. So one of the reasons for publishing this book at, at this particular point in time was to basically achieve social order and cohesion in the nation and to, uh, to, to, pro to, to stimulate, if you will, or to, 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 to promote immigrant uh, assimilation among these newcomers. Uh, the, the author of this book, um, Jens uh, Troslo Adams, published an editorial in 1933 in the New York Times in which he says, and let me re read it because it's a very short, uh, a couple of sentences. He says, and I think this is a very good definition of the dream that has something to do with the story I'm trying to say. He says, the, the dream is a vision of a better, deeper, richer life 
for every individual, regardless of the position in society which he or she may occupy by, by the accident or by birth. Um, this is very important because um, when um, the United States uh, was confronted with the menace of Nazi Germany and the later on with the expansionism of communism, one of the uh, ways to promote American value was to, provide, to, to promote the United States as the land of opportunity for, for everyone, um, where everyone had a chance to be themselves and to make it by themselves and to improve their lifestyle. This idea of individualism was very much against the sort of the collective mindset that both Nazi Germany, nationalism, and communist policies were trying to, to implement. So uh, when uh, Nelson Rockefeller uh, was uh, uh, put in charge of the Inter-American Affairs Office in the State Department, and therefore began to, in earnest, promote a culture as part of diplomacy, uh, the situation that he encountered was very similar to the situation that uh, uh, immigrants and scholars encountered uh, 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 in the beginning of the Great Depression when this idea was formulated. So you could see why this idea was very convenient to basically resolve uh, global problems because he had really done a very good job resolving social problems in the United States 10 years before. Um, specifically, uh, some of the values that, that the American dream promotes are the ones that I outlined here and I summarized before. Um, I mean, I don't need to go over this part. I already mentioned it to you. Uh, so, so uh, again, this, is, this become a very powerful, um, uh, very powerful message. What I do like to say with regard to this particular uh, part of my presentation is that oftentimes when we run uh, different programs uh, under the rubric of cultural diplomacy, such as uh, ac academic exchanges, uh, philanthropic missions, uh, the promotion of culture, promotion of uh, movies, of, of music, we don't realize that those programs and those uh, cultural attributes uh, have, uh, you know, they, they, they have an embedded message. They have a message that is, that is part of the, uh, of, of the, of the program. Um, I, I can cite many examples, and many of you are quite familiar with many examples of this, but uh, one, of, one that I, I think would suffice is to say that uh, I, I was always struck by the fact that many uh, communist countries um, uh, basically prohibited American music and American jazz. And, and people say, well, what is this the case? Uh, you know, jazz is benign, it's an entertainment. But when you, f when you think about it, jazz is not benign and entertainment. It's an expression of individual es individualism and individual expression. Uh, during jazz, you have to improvise. You have to, uh, you know, you, you can you can play a solo and so on and so forth. And and this is this is a, a very subtle message that that takes place and that is promoted without you know offending anyone. And therefore, it, it is absorbed uh, easily by by those abroad. So um, basically. Um, one of the, uh, one of the um, my, my argument then is that uh, as these programs were, were promoted overseas, uh, many immigrants uh, began to, um, to, to basically absorb, like the Vargas uh, families did, these, these values, and began to look at the United States as the only country that could provide these opportunities for them. Um, how do I know this? Well, I have conducted over the last two years over about over 42 interviews of immigrants uh, to basically uh, write this paper. And I have also looked at multiple surveys by the Pew Research Center and uh, by the Gallup organization. And one of the things that I find very st uh, striking is that when immigrants are asked about the American dream, they show a more a, high, a highest rate of acceptance 
uh, than anyone else in the United States. In other words, for many average American, the American dream is in doubt, given the economic situation of the country. Yet, for immigrants, it's the complete opposite. They, they still, at a very high rate, say that they believe in the ideas of the American dream, and this is what they hear, okay? So um, the other thing, the other argument uh, is that the, uh, if we ask the question, why is it that people are coming to the United States in disproportionate numbers, there are obviously many reasons for it. There are legal reasons, geographical proximity, uh, rel relatives, family networks that are here, many, many reasons. But also, one of those reasons that we need to consider is this dissemination of values. Um, the United States, uh, if you look at the data, uh, accept more immigrants than any other nation by far. Okay? And, and this is, a, a more immigrants wants to come uh, to the United States, a waiting list is horrendously alone, wants to come and, uh, into the United States precisely because they want to fulfill this dream. And then finally, another component is uh, the, the, the question of illegal immigration. Uh, not only do we count legal migration, but if we add the legal immigra illegal immigration, we have il currently in our country 11 million illegal immigrants that are also trying to fulfill this dream. Uh, let me conclude uh, by giving you a specific example of the impact of this kind of program, and that is uh, what has transpired here in Washington, D.C. Um, if you look at the history of Washington, D.C., I think it's fair to say that migration and ethnic diversity has transformed the city into a cosmopolitan enclave. Uh, if you look at the history of Washington, D.C., you will see that uh, starting in the 1950s, there has been one wave of immigration after another. First in the late 50s, then there was a, an, another peak in the, in the mid 60s and late 60s, then it flattened in the 70s, and then it came back in the 1980s in great numbers. If you ask anyone of this cohort of immigrants, why did they come to, the United, to, 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 uh, to Washington, D.C.? They, they always uh, either name the American dreams by, by his name, or if not, they uh, identified some of the attributes of the American dream. So in short, um, ideas, values are important. Uh, sometimes they have unintended consequences, and, and we know they are important not only because they, they promote uh, a, a flow of immigrants, but because also, they transform uh, local affairs in many cities and uh, many metropolitan areas around the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I think, um, you know, to add to both of your comments, I, uh, you know, I think it's safe to say that when we look around the world, there is no other country that has such a successful cultural diplomacy as we have in the United States. Um, the idea mm -hmm. of branding or marketing a particular country is not, you know, I don't think that anyone has been as successful as the United States in doing so. Um, and, and, you know, not only is, is the United States a, a presented overseas as a land of opportunity, and, you know, for many people it is, I'm not denying that at all, but it's also um, presented as the only country that can provide these opportunities. This is why it's called the American dream. So, so by definition, the idea is, well, we in the United States are better than anybody else because we provide these opportunities and other countries do not provide the same opportunity to the same extent. Um, and then finally, another very significant, in my opinion, uh, a, a component of this is that uh, part of this, part of the American dream is that the United States is presented as uh, being in the forefront, forefront of pro progress, Where, and, and, and the rest of the country uh, not so much. Uh, so they are, the United States is the leader in terms of uh, uh, social economic progress, and everyone else is sort of follows. Um, 
and, and we can argue whether this is the case. You know, in some, ca in some cases, uh, the, the, you know, if you look at the Human Development Report, for example, the quality of life in some countries is much higher than in the United States. Uh, um, you know, I don't know if all of you are aware of this, but um, basically The Economist uh, published a study about three years ago in which it ranked uh, countries in terms of uh, how well democracies were, the, democra the democratic process was working. And the United States was ranked uh, 15 in the world. But we can argue the methodology maybe is bias, whatever, but the United States was ranked 15 in the world. Um, so in other words, there were other 14 countries that were, were the, the, the democracy was working much better than the United States. However, our cultural diplomacy doesn't say so. In our cultural diplomacy, the United States is the epitome of a political stability and political democracy and freedom and all these kind of things. And again, I'm not saying that it's not. I'm complete, I think that there is a lot of freedom here and all of that. I'm not saying that it is. I'm just arguing the ways presented overseas, you know, and, and the fact that in other countries it's not presented in the same, in the same way. You know, I'll I, I, I be honest with you. Um, um, I mean, I, I would say that the, the closest country that, that has uh, some form of ideology in terms of opportunities and economic well-being perhaps will be Germany, given how strong the economy is in that country. Um, but I don't think, I mean, at least in my, this is just my opinion, and I welcome everyone's uh, feedback on this. I don't think that a German culture can compare with, with the United States. Um, you know, and this is somewhat subjective, but I think if you ask around the room, uh, they are, this is a very diverse and cosmopolitan group. Uh, if people go see an American film and a German film, most likely people end up trying to imitate the American actors, not the Germans. Uh, I'm always struck, for example, when I see video, I've never been to China, but when I see video clips uh, of people in China, young people in China, they seem to, they adopt American values. They have basketball shorts and you know, they have hairstyles that in, in some cases, I'm not saying everybody, it's a huge country that imitate the United States, but I don't see that taking place. I mean, I don't, I don't see people having a German style haircut or something, you know. I don't see people having, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a German, you know, football shirt, uh, you know. But in the United, in the United States, sometimes people you know, they, they, you know, Michael Jordan, I mean, sometimes you see, for example, Michael Jordan, in the, even in the poorest country, people want to wear number 23. Even, you know, I, I never thought that I would see a soccer player or a football player wearing the number 23. When I used to play uh, football in Europe, when I was living there, you either go from 1 to 11, and that's it, you know. If you play, if you had a, a number higher than 11, you were in the bench. And now people have, <laughs> you know, people have 23, and it's a sort of pride. You know, everybody has 23, but why 23? Well, 23 because of Michael Jordan. You know, um, and I, if 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 you allow me, I know time is of essence, but I can tell you a, a kind of like a very personal story. I have three kids, and um, when my kids were growing up, you know, my wife and I one time we went to to the store to buy them a pair of sneakers. And my, my kids would say, well, I want the, the, this Nike, Jordan Nike. And I asked my, my son, why do you want the, the Jordan Nike? And he said, because I can jump much higher. <laughs> 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 you know, I mean, this is, it's, a, it's, an, it's incredible, you know, how all of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know all, uh, all of these values and attributes are promoted. So uh, not only here in the United States, but also abroad. I, I agree with both of you. I mean, I think that, in fact, I would say that the European identity is not only about peace, but it's about quality of life. It's about val valuing other aspects of, of, of society that, that we don't necessarily value as much here in the United States because, you know, the United States is highly commodified as a society. And, and there are many individuals that 
want to go to Europe purposely because they, they share this idea, you know. And again, if you allow me to share a personal story, this same uh, kid of mine that wanted to buy the sneakers because he jumped high, uh, next year he's gonna be uh, working in Granada, in Spain, for a year, perhaps maybe two. Uh, he loves European lifestyle. Uh, he doesn't <laughs> want to live here for a, so, so this is also very appealing to a lot of people. Uh, and, and then the, the, finally, the other comment uh, related to you, your comment is that you're absolutely right, uh, but what is fascinating about the American dream is that the American dream never says that it's a collective dream. It says that it's an individualistic dream. So, so, so this is actually a, a, a very interesting because a, a, a people can say, well, a lot of people go back, a lot of people don't make it here, and those who promote the American dream said, oh, we knew that all along. It's, it's, it's not for everybody, it's for individuals, but some individuals will do it all is done. And I'm not trying to, to, to justify it, I completely agree with you, it's a dream. I'm just simply saying that it was formulated in a very intelligent way to not, so that it would be very hard to be dismissed by anyone. We cannot simply say, oh, we, we don't fulfill the American dream because the response that those who promote the American dream will be, well, it's never intended to be collected for everybody. It's, called, it's intended to be for individuals. Right. And, for, and, and, and every individual measures success in a very different way. I look at it as an opportunity. Opportunity. Exactly, exactly. Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. so please uh, join me to express our gratitude to Professor Ramon Gonzalez for this wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.